Someone says, what if you had an experience that is difficult to speak dealing with the tricksters and now have trust issues? How do you overcome this? Listen, you, you, okay, I know this is with a lot of people. If you've dealt, I've dealt with lots of tricksters and everything else. Number one, you sh that should teach you this, that your trust should be in the words Christ gave to you and nothing else. The Bible specifically says, and this is why it's so important, you don't put your trust in mankind. If you, that's a responsibility, by the way. If you put your trust in man, you're going to expect man to do something. I'm going to give you some advice. You don't have to take it, but I don't expect any human being out there to meet any of my expectations. I don't put my trust in people. I'm going to love my brother and keep them free of any expectations I have. All that's in my father who cannot fail. If I can see it, I will not put my expectations in it. All that goes in the father. Now, that does this thing right here. If I had a if 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 Sister Mayor one day she said, Well, I gotta go somewhere for a month, I know I said I would do so and so, but I gotta go somewhere and say, Hey, you be careful, okay? You you know why? Because I'm dependent upon the Lord. I'm trusting in the Lord. Right? I don't have to obligate anybody to do anything. They're not gonna upset me if they walk away and come back a thousand times. That doesn't upset me. My trust is in the Lord. I keep my fellow man free so I can love them freely. The moment you put your trust in someone, see, that's what the world teaches you. Well, you got to earn trust and trust this and trust that and trust and trust and trust. But all they do is put burdens upon somebody because as soon as I tell a person I can really trust you, you know what that really means? You know what that means? I'm going to load you up with personal responsibilities. I'm going to load you up with doing, keeping this standard of mine. And the day you break it, I'm going to hate you forever. That's all, that's all you're doing. I'm not doing that to another person just as fallible as I am. So long as my brother or sister is in the flesh, I know that darkness can work in the flesh. Right? So I'm not going to burden them that way. They need to be free. I'm not going to place anybody in chains like that. That's actually placing people in chains. I can give a child a responsibility. Suppose they fail to meet that responsibility. Then I'll have a talk with a child about, about, you know, doing better. But I will not fuss at the kid. Some of you, you are bitter because your parents never said, well done. You worked your little self to death and all they said was you didn't do it right. That's why you're so bitter today. Don't pass that on to somebody else. And, 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 and when you do this, when you put your trust in the Lord and everything else fails, you still have your joy. And you're able to work out anything in the world. If you've been double-crossed, then don't say, don't say, well, I'm not going to do that again. I say, you shouldn't have did that the first time. All of your trust should have been in the Lord. When it comes to a partner, make sure you're in a holy union. Don't go into some unholy union expecting an holy outcome. If you enter into something with unrighteousness, you already know what the results can be. Don't expect righteousness to come from unholy unions, right? But wait upon the Lord. He knows your perfect match. He does. Listen, you're being prepared. You're being prepared for blessings. God must prepare you to receive a blessing. Somebody else out there is being prepared to receive a blessing. At the appointed time, two blessings may be brought together, both prepared for one another. If you rush into it yourselves, you're going to be working out a whole bunch of stuff, and you're going to lose all your hair doing it. Or you're going to be heartbroken a million times over. How many people found this out? That when one situation goes sour, five or six more follow. How many found that out? Because that's the Lord communicating to you. Put your trust in me. Do not put your trust in man. Put your trust in me. It doesn't matter how great you think the person is. Place your trust in the Lord and leave your brothers and sisters free so you can love them without condition. So you can love them past their flaws, past their letdowns, past everything else. Because, see, I don't know a person who could ever let me down. They can't do it. Because there's nothing in me dependent upon them. Everything of me is dependent upon Yahshua HaMashiach. I'm free of that. And in so doing, I can enjoy 
appreciate my brothers and sisters, even when they do some crazy things. If their lives fall apart, it doesn't affect mine. But I'm able to go to them without restraint and without, without any restrictions and encourage them. But if I were to put my trust in them and their life fell apart, I would have conflict. I would say, well, what do I do now? Now I need to replace this person. This person gave me a headache. I've seen that happen before. Pe that person goes to another person. Well, I know you're having a hard time, but you put me in a hard spot. And that will never happen to me. It'll never do it. I appreciate everything of my brothers and my sisters. They're by, mean, by, means, they're by no means under any obligation. Everything is a gift. Everything is. And I keep it that way so they can be free because I know how crafty Satan can be. How easily he can sneak into somebody's life and turn a whole relationship upside down. I know how easily we can be spoiled. I won't permit that. He's not going to use me against you. I won't permit that. Hopefully others will do the same. You can love the other person. You can appreciate the other person. That person can be a continual joy. The moment you entrust them with something, you have placed responsibility upon them they may not be able to keep. And that's going to sour the relationship in the end. Because it builds up tension, animosity, and all these things you don't need in your life. Stay free. Stay free. We have a good shepherd. If you need to trust anything, trust the shepherd. And enjoy your fellowship. And grow with your fellowship. And encourage your fellowship. But trust the shepherd. Does that make sense? I hope it makes sense. I hope it does. Listen. Thoughts again. Uh, your brain is like a waiting room. Right? Your brain is like a device that picks up spiritual reception. It's just like anybody. Who can lay down at night... And quiet their mind and empty out their thoughts. Can anybody do that? Anybody do that? Anybody can quiet? I remember when somebody asked me that one time, right? And I laid down and all sorts of thoughts hit my mind. I said, oh my goodness, I can't shut my mind up. What, what's going on? You know what I can do now though? I can lay back and I'm telling you right now, I can clear my mind. No noise. No thoughts, no troubles, no anything. I can start thinking about the throne, scripture. I can even, in my mind's eye, open up the Bible and start flipping through pages. It's the funniest thing. Once you learn what thoughts really are, you will effectively rebuke all the negative ones. But you have to press through no matter what your thoughts are. The Bible says, the Bible says take captive your thoughts. And I should let you know that your thoughts, all of your thoughts are not yours. They are communications. You know, it's possible that Eve spoke to Satan that way. Because Satan is like a mentalist. He is. Can you imagine if he were to, what if he, what if Eve, right, encountered the serpent, but it was different than anybody thinks? What if Eve, in her mind, when Satan told her when she was reminded what God said, what if she had a thought, but it was actually Satan saying, God knows when you eat of the tree, you're going to be like he is, knowing good from evil. That sounds like a thought to me. Because immediately after she talked to him, she saw the tree was good for food. Good to make one wise. Right? All these positive reasons reinforcing why she should defy God to get it. That sounds like the thought realm. Even if it were physical, right? Within a kosh, even if it were physical, she was still in a mental type struggle. Can you all see that? Because today, in today's world, you can be reading the Bible, and I'm telling you now, thoughts, intrusive thoughts, will enter into your mind. Unholy thoughts. Like the brother just said. So what do you do when Satan is speaking? You proclaim the name of the Lord. You remind everything that that's holy ground. You take captive those thoughts and say, not here. 
and you press forward with righteousness, not giving in to what just defiled or attempted to defile that ground. No unholy thing should be in there. You should tell it the scripture. Know ye not that, that, that I am the temple of God because of the Holy Spirit. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Don't entertain him. Resist him. To resist the devil is to refuse what he just said. You don't hear his whole paragraph, right? And then say, no, I'm not doing that. No, nope. as soon as that intrusive thing enters into your mind, you press forward with righteousness. You encourage your own soul. And you say, no, 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 no. No, I'm born again in Christ by faith. And you stand against any thought that would come into your mind that would ever dethrone Christ as being number one or speak against him. Let nothing do that. And I'm telling you, continue to do this, your mind's going to be clear. Worry. If, if you're in prayer and worry enters into your mind, that's not holiness. That's unholiness. Don't let Satan sneak into your life through some what you think is a valid reason. When you're in prayer time, that's you and the Father. Don't let anything creep in there, because let me tell you something. When you're, when you're talking about the Lord or something like that, all sorts of weird things will begin to happen. You get past one thing, something else will happen. You get past that, something else will happen. You're going to go through a series of events. That's how you know it's spiritual, because you'll go through a series of events. The interruption will come by way of thought first. You rebuke that or stand against it. It's coming by a physical form. Somebody's going to cut their finger, have an emergency or something like that. You go by that, the phone's going to start ringing off the hook. Somebody's in a panic on the other line. Always something to interrupt your time with the Lord. And you've got to learn to choose him over every single thing in your life. See, I'm going to tell you something in my life. In my life, I've learned that in truth, people have no emergencies. They only think they do. But there are certain times when I'm doing things with the Lord, I will permit no interruption. None. But other than those times I'm on standby, I'm waiting for an interruption. Somebody has one. Not to be ready to hear it. But even in that with the interruption... Right? I've done that. I started something else. I would involve them in the prayer. All of a sudden, the interruption starts. You know how people like to call in the middle of your time with the Lord? Then involve them in the prayer. I bet they won't call any more that time of day. They say, oh, no, I'm not praying. Click. That's what they'll do. They'll run. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You can only resist Satan with the word. Jesus resisted Satan with the word. He did not resist Satan with his own words. So don't use your own words, but tell him what thus saith the Lord. That's how you resist Satan. You don't entertain everything he says. You cut him off and say what thus saith the Lord. Nothing unholy should be in what's deemed the temple of God. You are deemed the temple of God because you house something holy. The Spirit of God poured out on all flesh, not some flesh. So if you said yes to Christ... You are now considered a temple built without hands. And nothing unholy should be in there. To rebuke something is to stand against it. Rebuke is an action. It's, it's not just a word. You don't say I rebuke you, right? Rebuke means you're going to, to say I rebuke you means I stand against you. When you stand against something, then you're not agreeing with it, nor are you entertaining it. But you boot it out and go back to the Father. And that's how you do that. They will continue to come, but I'm telling you something, they'll stop when they find they cannot penetrate. And remember something with Satan, all of you. So long as something works, Satan will continue to use it. He's not going to waste his time. If something is not working, he will abandon that task. Some of you, he'll keep, some of you in your life, you'll say, well, Every time I do so-and-so, such-and-such happens. Yes, it's because you keep reacting. You're talking to yourself after the phone call. You're mumbling and grumbling, and he's sitting there laughing. Ooh, I got them off balance. You're demonstrating that his assaults are working. That's what you're doing. The moment you stop reacting physically is the moment he's confused. He'll try a couple more times, and he stops. He'll always do it. Two more times, seems like he's trying to defile.
um, what people believe in the most, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But he does. He'll come back a couple more times. And if you're still standing against it and not reacting because we're showing these evil spirits everything they want to know. We show them when something works and when something doesn't work. When they're doing something and it doesn't work, we keep our peace. When they do something and it works, we lose control. And they're sitting there watching your reaction. They cannot track. They can't track what the outcome is. They're limited in that respect. You guys understand that? They're like somebody watching you all the time. There's something watching you all the time. And when something works, they're going to go tell everybody else, hey, all you have to do is wait until they're happy and then make so-and-so mad and influence him to go to her and she'll be all out of source if that happens to ruin her good day. So stop reacting. Hmm? Someone asks, how do you stop hurting yourself? By realizing you don't belong to yourself, you're bought with a price. Let me ask you this. Would you hurt anything that belongs to Yahshua HaMashiach that he loves so much? Because if you hurt yourself, you have agreed to destroy something that Jesus loves. That's all you have to have in your mind. You're bought with a price. You're not your own. Do, do you guys see how on, even in these questions, by knowing a simple truth, you can overcome so much? Do you see this? Do you all see that? By knowing a simple truth, you can overcome so much. The simple scriptures, these are not scriptures as scholars. that You have to go find a, a scholar to find out. No, it's a simple truth. It's a simple truth. And in your heart of hearts, you would never damage anything that belonged to Christ. Because you love him. You're bought with a price. Remember that. You're no longer your own. And if you're bought with a price, that means somebody paid the ultimate price for you. And you don't belong to yourself anymore. And if you don't belong to yourself, that is to say, there is someone who cherishes you. And if you hurt yourself, you're hurting what the Lord cherishes the most. Hmm? Okay, you all think I got them all. I, I, I think I did. That's what I'm thinking I did. I think I did. I think I did. Oh, let's see. Let's go back. I think I did. I think I did. Is this a wearing down of the saints? He will wear out the saints the most high. It's a scripture that has to be used in context when it says he will wear out the saints the most high. If you notice in Revelation, it says God will give him power over the saints and he will overcome the saints. Well, how is that? You ready for this? You ready? Now, when you rightly define the word of truth, you understand that that's for Israel. Why? Why do I say it's for Israel? Because in Israel, the Lord said, there's going to be mourning. In Israel, Zephaniah says, they will invade that place and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot. There are saints in Jerusalem. They're going to be outcast again, put out of the city. Some will not escape. They'll be killed. The wives will be ravished. It'll be horrible there. That's wearing out the saints the most time. But what is the Lord really doing? You see, in Jerusalem, there are people who believe in Yahshua in the heart, but they won't say it out loud. There's some who don't. He's going to separate them. He's going to take the individuals that are truly his. He's going to keep them. He's going to have them exiled. They're going to be sent out to certain portions. But the ones who have a militant heart, who are stayed upon their faith because they believe they control it, just like the Pharisees of old, they're going to be killed by the sword in the middle of Jerusalem. So during the siege, they will be killed and the other ones won't be. Now, what the Lord will eventually do is, after all that's over, he's going to look upon all those who set their eyes upon Israel, and God will, in, God will intervene and get them directly, pushing them, getting them out of the way, but also leading his people back there. He will purify them. They're going to be refined. They're going to be purified. Then it's written when Jesus comes back, they're not going to know who he is. They're going to say, who put these holes in your hands? And he'll say, my friends did this to me. God will keep a portion of the people unto himself. He will not make a full end of his people. He never has. He never will. But he will keep a portion to himself. So wearing out of the saints of the Most High is going to be that, that geographical location of Jerusalem. Now, what's going to happen to us? Well, before that time ever comes, we're going through the compromise right now. See, the Lord already said it. When he bid his guests, he said that his guests would go through a bunch of things. 
before the wedding. Do you guys understand that? You have to go through a bunch of stuff now. Now. But isn't it ironic that God's people, people, they don't believe right now. They're going to be wore out just like it says in the Bible. But what about you? You've been going through it. Can't you see that? Your whole life has been turbulent, has been tribulation. Can't you see that? Your whole life has been turbulent. And what did Jesus say? Woe to you who laugh now. You're going to cry later. But he said, he said, he said, blessed are you who cry now. You will laugh later. What does that mean? That means those who are going through it now will not go through it later. And those who are not going through it uh, uh, right now are going to go through it later. Most, a lot of people are scared of great tribulation, not realizing the grace of God. That he has stretched out your tribulation and has called your life. You're the ones that accept him. He already wrote about you. He also wrote about the people he still loves that don't accept him and what they have to go through. The hour of testing will come upon them. Pray that you're worthy to escape all these things and to stand before the Son of Man. You know, that word is relevant for all generations, not just one. Not just one. That means pray that you finish your race. He did not say, woe to those who are in New York. Right? It's not what he said. He didn't say go flee to the mountains, those of you who live in New York. Philadelphia, right? He didn't say that. He didn't say that. That's not what he said. Those people he told to flee was because the abomination of desolation was set up as spoken of by the prophet Daniel. That's in a specific location. That's during the siege. That's chapter 11. That's when all the armies build up and they take over Jerusalem. And then they put uh, place everybody else captive. Some do escape. And God said, what about that captivity? He's going to purge them, make them white, dry them. He's changing them. All that stubbornness, any of them may have in them, it will not be in there when the Lord comes. He's going to prepare them because they will ultimately receive him and salvation will be in Zion. What about you? Well, if you're the guests, then you're with them already. See, because he said he's coming with the saints with him. But in the Bible, it says those in Jerusalem we're going to see him come down to the ground. That's what it said. But he's coming, and he's bringing his saints with him. Some believe now. They'll be with him when he comes. Some will finish the race now. They're going to be with him when he comes. But there are great many in Jerusalem, in the heartland, in the holy land. There are many who do not believe in Yahshua HaMashiach. They're still waiting on his arrival the first time. They reject that he came here already. And no, God will not destroy all of them, but is keeping them unto himself. He is faithful. I tell you, if you go read it and listen. Now, I have never read the Bible by instruction of somebody else. I've never listened to everybody else's interpretation either, so I'm not influenced by anybody else's interpretation. I am not. I had to solely trust upon the Lord by reading the Word of God. And I've gone through the Bible now, this is dozens of times. Not just one chapter, but the whole thing. And I do so because I get stuck in the story. And I'm telling you, I'm, I'm pursuing Him. I'm on a search. But I'll tell you, the more you read the whole Bible in context, the more of a complete story that you, you see this complete story, a beautiful story. It's not a bad story. It's not anything most people say it is. It is beautiful from start to finish. It's a process that no one can ever fake, nor can they trick it. It shows and it tells of God's faithfulness and our true purpose of being here and what he's actually doing. And if somebody, somebody, if they could understand why they're here, they'd probably break out into tears. You're not here to be punished nor to be lost. You're here to be grown. This is the womb. You're in the womb. Part of the process. Your deliverance has already begun and nothing will stop it. 
This is God's creation, not Satan's. God knows exactly what Satan does. God has to permit Satan to even move left or right, or he cannot exist. He will never have power over the saints, lest God grant him that power. And God does so for a time in Revelation for the purpose of the beast. But even in that, that's a full deliverance of his people. That's what brings them around. The prophets came, and they killed the prophets. They tried to tell him what thus saith the Lord. Jesus came, and they put Christ to death. He told them what thus saith the Lord. The apostles came, and they put them to death. And they told them what thus saith the Messiah. And now you have a bunch, you have a bunch of Bibles all over the world. And everything is telling them what thus saith the Lord. And they still won't receive it. That's why it was written in the Bible. You'll not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And I tell you, that time is sooner than you think. Because after they are purged, after they're under such weight, they'll see. We see with, with God's people of the Amorite and the Hittite that he cleaned up and washed up. They are a stiff-necked people. That means you don't believe anything unless they see it. So the Lord's going to show them. But seeing without faith comes with a consequence. You believe by faith, no need for you to have to go through what they're about to go through with because you believe by faith. The Lord said, you believe because you see. Blessed are they who believe and have not seen. That's you. Those who it has to be proven to them before they accept. It. There's a woe unto them. There's something they have to go through. It is a physical tasking that will cost lives. Not to destroy them, but to save their souls. Hmm? Man is not the expert on what God is going to do. God is the expert on what God is going to do. All of us will ultimately see the truth of all things at the end. As for me, I have no preconceived notions. I don't. Because I don't know all things of the word. I do know this one thing. Jesus of Nazareth. He is our Savior. And all who believe upon him. And he meant every word he said. And he will not fail. In all of his promises. And he will bring us all the way home. That much I know. That much I trust in. Because that's what's been given As far as telling you what the Father is saying and what he's going to do and how he's going to do it, the Father will do what he desires to do. This is his creation. But the Father is a Father of truth. And he gave us that truth. But it's up to him to reveal, have that truth revealed unto us. That he will do. So trust his timing. Trust it. And keep going and finish the race. Do your best. That way you're not a hypocrite. Hypocrites go where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And hypocrites are those who could have done, but they did not. They didn't do their best. The Lord put more in you than that. And that's why you're the oddballs of your family. That's why you have so many questions. Because you see differently, you hear differently. You can't quite believe the way everybody else believes. For many of you, he put you right in the middle of a stiff-hearted people. To bear witness to something you couldn't possibly dream of. But I tell you this, the end result is good. The trials and the struggles may be long and hard. But... The Lord is faithful. And you would not believe what they have already changed in you. But we're all going to see.